Hello, welcome to this educational program by the Association of Foreign Press Correspondents in the United States, AFPC USA. I'm Patricia Vasconcelos, a board member of the Association White House Correspondent for SPT, Brazilian TV Network. On today's program, we talk about the Black History Month, its importance and also the relevance of coverage by us foreign journalists and foreign media. Our guest today, he is already here with us, Luvo Anderson. He's an associate professor of philosophy at Syracuse University, New York, and an affiliate faculty member of Women's and Gender Studies and African American Studies. Professor Luvo Anderson, thank you so much for being here and uh, sharing your time and talking to us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's wonderful to be here. Thanks again. Professor Luvo Anderson earned his PhD in philosophy at Rutgers University. Uh, he's the co-editor of the Rutledge Companion to the Philosophy of Race and the forthcoming Oxford Handbook of Applied Philosophy of Language. He's the author of several articles on the semantics and problematics of racial slurs, epistemic injustice, and racial humor. Luvo Henderson is currently writing books on the ethics of racial humor and the philosophy of race and races. His research and teaching interests include philosophy of language, African-American philosophy, aesthetics, humor, and social ontology. So we celebrated the Black History Month um, here in the United States in February. Uh, however, we understand that this is a topic that is important to talk about um, no matter when. So in order to provide our colleagues, foreign journalists uh, based here in the US about, you know, uh, knowledge that we can use in our daily work, what are the origins and the history um, of the Black History Month? Yeah, so Black History Month actually started as Negro History Week, and it was started by the historian Carter G. Woodson in 1926. Mm -hmm. now, Woodson saw it important to create this uh, History Week as a way of a kind of mass education program. So it was a way of combating prevailing prejudices against the role of Black Americans and Black people more broadly in the history of the world. Um, it became Black History Month in 1976 when the organization that he founded, uh, ASALA, stands for Association for the Study of Afro African American Life and History, proposed extending it to a month. And that date, 1976, was important for three reasons. Basically, it marked the bicentennial of the founding of the United States. It also marked the 50th anniversary of the, the organization's founding. And then lastly, it marked the centennial anniversary of Woodson's birth. And is there a particular reason of why it's celebrated in, in February? So Woodson chose February to basically correspond to some practices and celebrations that had already been ongoing in the Black American communities. Uh -huh. uh, so there were basically two, two traditions that um, were ongoing. One was the celebration of Abraham Lincoln's birthday uh -huh. since his assassination in 1865. And then there had also been a tradition of celebrating Frederick Douglass's birthday, uh, at least since the 1890s. Uh -huh. And so Woodson, according to the historian Dale Scott, chose February as a way of piggybacking on these existing traditions and trying to expand it. So it's one basically to honor the birthdays of Douglas and Lincoln and to find a, a hook that basically he could sort of um, attach the, the newly expanded understanding of history to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so as far as I'm concerned, and every year there is a theme, uh, right, to, to mark this, this celebration. And this year, uh, the theme of the Black History Month was African Americans and the arts. Uh, what can you address about this theme, um, the influence of our African Americans that they have in the fields of arts? 
I know it's a very broad question, but as that's the theme this year, and it what is this important? Yeah, so the arts has been one place historically that African Americans have been allowed to make significant contributions. Mm -hmm. It's a, a place where, for example, we see innovations in music, in comedy, and um, even in the visual arts. So mm -hmm. I, I believe it was either W.E.B. Du Bois or James Baldwin who argued that African Americans have essentially created America's unique cultural contributions to the world. Mm -hmm. like it's given us its unique music form. Um, there are, I think, High on the Hog is a show on Netflix that walks through some of the, the culinary history of America and the role that African Americans have played in elevating America's cuisine. Mm -hmm. So the arts has, has been an important site, and especially during, I would say, the, I guess, the early to mid 20th century. You see it, important Black arts movements that tie themselves to the, the Black freedom struggle. And so uh -huh. this was a focus, for example, of the Harlem Renaissance. They thought that through the arts, you Black people could express or declare their humanity, display their humanity to the world, right? As a way of saying, well, look, we are fully human beings. Um, here's the evidence, right? And, and you sort of, connect with audiences through their literature or music or uh, mm -hmm. the visual arts and so forth. Mm -hmm. It's also, I believe, also a way to engage of those topics uh, in a in a positive way, right? Engage the society in a, right. in a positive way. Um, from my perspective, um, the coverage that we have of the Black a month history in the foreign media is is a still very uh little little I might be wrong but this is this is my feeling uh so uh, from your perspective how do you believe that we can increase this coverage uh and under which or what aspects the coverage of the Black History Month and everything that involves what is being you know celebrated and discussed um but abroad. So I think there are some ch current challenges to our understanding of history, uh, especially in states like Florida and Texas and North Carolina, mm -hmm. that I think highlight the importance of covering uh, Black history, not just as its, I guess, official nationally recognized celebration in Black History Month, mm -hmm. but also just in terms of how we think about the greater overall historical narratives that we craft. Oh. And so I think, um, the, for example, there are two instances I'll, I'll highlight that I think detail the importance of thinking about covering not Black history in general. Okay. The first has to do with Ron DeSantis's efforts in Florida to basically prohibit or outlaw what he calls, I guess, uh, woke, woke um, DEI initiatives, what that he characterizes as basically attempts to, I guess, indoctrinate employees and students into thinking that one race is morally superior to another, or that one ought to feel anguish and guilt at being white. Um, that he, together with the journalist Chris Rufo put under the label of critical race theory. So it, it kind of it makes this kind of expansive label that targets anything that might challenge the preferred historical narrative about America's founding, about the founders themselves, uh, puts under that label as a kind of form of attack on decency or a form of attack on what they regard as the true history or the true story of America's founding. Mm -hmm. So attacks like that tell you something, there's something important about the ideas and, and the concepts and the constructs that are expressed in uh, Black historical accountings. Mm -hmm. The second has to do with the executive order that the Trump administration issued in 2020. Uh, I think it was called, let me see, it's called the 
Um, <clears throat> excuse me. All right. The Executive Order on Establishing the President's Advisory 1776 Commission, which was an executive order that again attempted to establish the state's preferred telling of American history over others by granting it a kind of official government stamp of authority. Again, you see uh, the imposition of the state, state's preferred story, trying to wield its power, its authority to raise the stories it favors and to quash the stories it disprefers, right? Mm -hmm. But again, you see, uh, again, a kind of state intrusion that attempts to basically tell us which historical stories to believe and which to prefer. Mm -hmm. So those two events are just a number, two examples of, I think, a number of instances that suggest to me that thinking through and thinking through history, thinking through the way that we tell the stories uh, about our founding, about the processes of how we formed as a nation, uh, bear a really significant import, a thing that we should pay attention to, because those in power are concerned to determine which way we go, which way we think about it. We should be paying attention to that. You're an academic, a PhD. You teach us at um, uh, Syracuse University, New York. Um, so from your perspective, by changing or deciding what to teach or what is uh, allowed or not allowed, that's what you're uh, describing here. Um, so two questions. Um, do you do you believe that is this a way of reshaping maybe a, a particular view of American history? Is that your your point of view? And what would be um, the right way or the right path? Independence for the universities to decide what to to teach, how it should be. Yes, I'm concerned with intellectual freedom mm -hmm. you know, to pursue lines and see where they lead. Mm -hmm. People are going to have, they're going to end up in different places. Right? So people will have different views about what happened or what is true and so forth. But we need to allow kind of, uh, I think, a broad swath of views to exist because as I guess the, the old saying goes, iron sharpens iron. Right? Mm -hmm. When people are, uh, when people engage in these kinds of activities of trying to seek out knowledge, trying to, to find out what's true, trying to produce knowledge in sincere and rigorous ways, we all, I think, those of us who do this genuinely end up with bits of pieces of the truth, but no one gets the whole truth. So we all need to bounce ideas off one another in order to arrive at something that's more consistent with the way things actually are. Mm -hmm. So as pedagog as teachers and as researchers, I think it's important, I think it's crucial that we be given uh, the space and the freedom to pursue research in genuine ways without having to worry about I don't know, punishment or retribution from governments who have a very narrow way, a narrow idea, or um, have an agenda that doesn't always fit with pursuit of truth. Mm -hmm. And can you think about recent examples of efforts uh, or successful um, um, initiatives to keep the truth on Black history? So I think two prominent ones in the past 10 years are uh, the 1619 Project. Uh, that's the project Nicole Hannah-Jones led, I think, in the New York Times as one effort to do so. And then the second, I want to say, is the opening of the National Museum of African American History and Culture in D.C. Uh, so a national site of African American history and culture in the National Mall, also mm -hmm. a publicly available resource that aims at educating the public, making certain history, historical facts about African-Americans in this, in this case, open and, and available to the public. Uh, mm -hmm. To my mind, two significant projects that have aimed to keep the truth on Black history 
uh, in the past decade or so. Mm -hmm. Is the Black Lives Matter movement, which is a very specific um, movement, contribute um, as well? Ultimately, I think yes. I think it is, well, obviously it is a movement aimed at trying to achieve greater justice for Black Americans, right, speared by uh, violence against the Black people uh, by police and vigilantes. So I think the, if I recall, the earliest instance of the Black Lives Matter uh, phrase appeared around Trayvon Martin, I think it's tw uh, around 2012, I want to say, something like that. Um, so it's, again, a, a way of, I think it has an indirect link to the way that we understand racial history in, in the United States. Is the oh, primary sort of theme or motive, right, was to say, well, the way that Black people are treated in this country, uh, it essentially is a way of showing that Black lives historically have been devalued in the country. And so it, the movement essentially made a call to correct that, to value Black American lives just as much as any other life, right? So it makes a positive declaration about a justice claim, but also it, it re reaches back to historical claim. And I think that's sort of what drove some animus towards the movement is that it makes this historical claim that people dislike, that some people dislike, right? Yeah. They want present a history where America is basically just the founding, the founders are basically just a heroic. There may have been some side missteps here and there, but on the whole, the American story is one of heroic people trying to create a place where everyone is treated equally, where democratic values and virtues are practiced, and it creates this really um, unique political association. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let's talk a bit about your um, work. You were the author of uh, several books uh, and also articles on the semantics of racial slurs and racial humor, right? What led you to research and write about this specific um, topic or point of view? Yes. Well, I guess I had always been interested in humor from early on. As a kid, I used to watch comedies with my mother, for example. We would watch like Jerry Lewis movies together, for example. Mm -hmm. So I just have that memory that's from early on. And I kind of came up on the topic almost accidentally. So in grad school, my dissertation director, Howard McGarry, suggested I take a look at an essay that was on racist humor. I hadn't thought about it as a topic that I would write about, but he suggested this paper, I read it, we discussed it, I ended up writing part of my dissertation on, on racial humor. Mm -hmm. And then at that point when I started writing, I noticed that at least in the philosophy literature, there wasn't a lot being written on the subject of racial humor itself. Hmm. There wasn't really a lot being written on humor as a topic in philosophy. It's been one of those under-theorized uh, topics in the philosophy literature. So it was just an area that was right for, uh, for, right for me to make a contribution, and especially with respect to racial humor, with which I don't, I mean, besides this article that talked about racist humor, there might have been, there was another article that was a response to that one, but you could probably count on one hand how many philosophy articles about racial humor there were at the time. You explained that you produced a dissertation about this topic. So I don't aim here to, you know, explain your dissertation and your academic uh, work in a search in a such short period of time. But what can you address or describe about what you have found um, linking philosophy and 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 comedy and and this this topic that you researched? 
So I think a lot of attention has been paid to, I guess, the kinds of intentions people have when they they try to tell a joke, they try to be funny, whether or not there are certain topics or subjects that are off limits, uh, stuff like that. I found myself thinking more about the social cultural conditions in which these kinds of jokes take place. And so what are the conditions, the surrounding conditions and what impact do they have on yeah. what we can say, how pe how we can expect people to receive what we say. And so I think more about the kinds of interpretations that are made available to people when you try to do something humorous, whether or not you will be more or less successful given what we can say about the cultural moment, uh, things like that. Uh -huh. so, my work thinks more about those kinds of things. And it's, I think once you place the emphasis on that, you find it's, I think, harder to say something that's true about, for example, whether or not a joke you tell, a racial joke you tell will be received as merely humorous or whether someone will take issue with it. That has, I think, less to do with the intentions you have in telling it and more to do with the conditions of the culture or um I guess the the zeitgeist the the spirit of the age right uh that has much more to do with how we receive and interpret humor um did you research any you know um comedy artists so what is the what would be the 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 good example or examples that you you find positive I don't know if it's possible to 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 describe if it's it's not a, an artist but um a, a behavior that you believe that it's more positive and has a positive impact impact on society what works more yes this is um a, a difficult question <laughs> like um so if i'm just giving examples of people who i thought were able to For, to make humorous stuff that is broadly accepted by a kind of wide, wider mainstream audience. Uh -huh. I think two examples come to mind for me. One is um, Trevor Noah and the other is Roy Wood Jr. Uh -huh. Of course, this is from The Daily Show, right? Uh -huh. uh, that has a broad American audience. And so it, they have to pitch jokes at a level that reaches across a wide spectrum of communities, uh, across racial, gendered, class, and so forth, and so on dimensions. Usually comedy that's safe, I think, isn't as funny, because it's safe and there's a kind of edge that I think people expect from comedy. So that, I mean, this is, for example, what makes dad jokes corny sometimes funny for their corniness but they're not the kind of thing that would get you described as the greatest of all time as a comedian or something like that right uh usually it's the more edgier stuff the stuff that i guess has a a narrow a, a narrower audience because it's can be so aggressive it can be so taboo violating that it's just not for everyone uh, and it's harder to like pitch it at a level where a broad audience can appreciate it. Uh, but I found, for example, Roy Wood Jr. to have, a, I think, a good balance between stuff that's safe for a broad audience, but that also edges towards the line, that also kind of edges towards that edginess that, um, that we appreciate in, I think, creative and innovative comedy. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah. Regarding uh the coverage again, going back to to which the 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 topics that we foreign journalists we usually cover here in the U.S. Um, what which stories from your perspective you would like to see more broadcasted? Uh, not only regarding the Black History Month, but everything that is related to the American Black history. So what do you think that it's more 
relevant or important um, to have this coverage, um, not from the media outlets that are here in the United States, but um, from media outlets that are abroad and they are represented here by us, right, foreign journalists. So which type of stories uh, you believe that it's more important or you feel that it's necessary to talk more about? Yeah, this is a good question. So I won't be able to name concrete instances, uh -huh. but I'm reminded of some things I've read here and there about particular communities um, that I think don't get the kind of coverage I think they should get. So there was a story I read a while ago about a small town in Southern Illinois, um, a predominantly black community that was, I think, basically under sewage water, essentially. So the the way that the infrastructure had been set up, the, I guess the sanitation lines or whatever, basically ran through this town. They were purposely directed towards the town uh, as a way of saddling the burden of waste keep in that community so as to protect the, the more white communities outside of that community. So stories that I think focus on some of the practical structural things that disadvantage communities of color uh, don't they don't tend to be stories that get highlighted in national or international coverage or uh, I think of, for example, the Flint Michigan water crisis. I think that got some coverage eventually. But the stories like that, or there's a, I think a similar kind of story that was happening in, I believe Jackson, Mississippi, also a kind of water shortage situation that focus, that was, uh, that negatively impacted the, the Jackson community, which is predominantly black, right? And the kinds of manipulations that the government, the Mississippi state government, uh, we're doing in order to, for example, privilege the interests of their white constituents communities and disadvantage the black residents of that state. Right, mm -hmm. so stories that sort of highlight the what I take to be obvious racial uh, racialized ways of disadvantaging some communities and advantaging others uh, that happen in places like Mississippi or Michigan or in Illinois. And Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's a challenge because most part of us we are based in the in in New York or in what here in Washington D.C. Some of us in Los Angeles, so it means you know travel more right through mm -hmm. the United States to to find these stories. What can you share about your future projects? Um, in not only in, at the university, but um, you were researching for a new book, it looks like, right? That's right. <laughs> I am finishing up a book on the ethics of racial humor, uh -huh. which is with the press now. And I'm thinking, excuse me, <clears throat> thinking about the next project. Which, which is? I think it's going to be a, a more trade friendly um, project where I want to think about the state of comedy and what lessons we can draw from it to think about things like freedom, creativity, and communication. Mm -hmm. Think about some of the recent controversies that have happened in the world of comedy over the past few years. Uh, so I'm thinking about the Dave Chappelle specials or Ricky Gervais, people like that. And the kinds of claims they make to try to combat some of the criticism that they received. I think those are complaints or uh, critiques about, again, what freedom looks like when trying to create art or the way that our moral principles and values might impact how creative our creativity, how we're supposed to create kinds of constrained places on, on that kind of activity. 
and also on the consideration, the kinds of things we need to consider when trying to communicate with one another, communicate with people who have different ideas from us. Like, uh -huh. how do we do that in our current polarized space? How do we communicate with other people? In a polarized, in a polarized place, you're saying? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So I think thinking through the kinds of controversies that have happened in comedy, the kind of crises that I think comedians and the comedic industry have faced in recent years might give us some lessons for thinking about these three kinds of themes or ideas. Mm -hmm. So do you believe that art, arts in general, are a good tool in order to link society and um, and, and put difficult topics on the table and to raise awareness in a positive way? Is it right? Yes, I think that's right. I think historically it's been that kind of thing, a, a, a place where you could broach difficult topics, but in a way that could draw audiences in to consider them, in a way that a, a lecture or uh, some kind of, I guess, um, intellectual book just can't. And you and you and you build awareness as well because regarding humor, I, I'm remembering I was watching a, a, an artist from Brazil that I admire him a lot, and he he made us laugh about something, and on the next line it was like something extremely dark and a, a horrible situation, but he made us laugh about a reality that was happening anyway in our country. And yeah. made me feel, uh, and and so yes, it's um, it's a very interesting um, skill, and it's difficult. I don't know if you write stand up comedies or you were, you basically oh. research. <laughs> I wouldn't be able to do though. So, uh, uh, no, I'm not a I'm not a comedian by any means. Um, yeah, I can, I can write about it. I can mm -hmm. offer some broader critical thoughts about it but mm -hmm. yeah I would not try to get up on a stage and give a set at all that, that's not my thing and what do you suggest for us foreign journalists um, where to find you know reliable or the best sources um, um, regarding that this topic not only the Black History Month but everything that is related you know to 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 the American Black Black History universities as the one you you were part of. Sure, that's one place. Um, I have three kind of um, sites that have online presences that uh, can be easily accessed. So one, uh, the first is the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, uh -huh. which is headquartered in in New York and Harlem. Uh, so it has a bunch of artifacts from various Black American figures. Uh, the second is, uh, I think, the Google Cultural Institute, Black History and Culture, also a, an accessible link that offers a lot in terms of uh, Black history and cultural artifacts. Mm -hmm. And then the last one is the NAACP Online. Would you repeat this last one? Uh, the NAACP Online. Okay. Mm -hmm. So all three of these are uh, have website links that and it, it's open to the public and people can access information there. Uh -huh. Okay, anything else you would like to to add? Anything you would like to address to to those who were watching and listening to us? Because this content is also part of our uh, podcast, Foreign Press Podcast. Um, anything related that what we 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 spoke here and uh, again, maybe the you know the the importance to 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 keep talking about this topic um, in in our daily lives and in in spaces like this one. Yeah, I think the last thing I can say is about the importance of this topic is that it it goes beyond just the the specifics about Black history. I think it really speaks to how we understand history in general, right? So Woodson's motivation for creating Black History Week wasn't to sort of confine the importance of Black history to a week and ultimately to a month. 
it was to make it a broader aspect of our daily lives year round and to combat, I think, a, a prevalent prejudice that has structured the way that we tell historical stories. Mm -hmm. So the the German philosopher uh, Hegel, for example, claimed that basically Africa and by extension Black people had no place in world history. And that has been a kind of guiding principle to essentially exclude Black voices and contributions from uh, our historical stories, historical narratives. So I think pressing on the point of the importance of Black history, uh, recovering it, of uh, learning it, celebrating it, as a way of pushing back against this wrong-headed notion or idea, this prejudice. So that that's, for me, that's what makes uh, protecting Black history and so protecting protecting it from the uh, the assaults of people like Chris Rufo and Ron DeSantis extremely important. Because once once we leave out important or significant parts of the overall story. We tend to tell a warp story that ends up hurting uh, the people that we ignore. Mm -hmm. Thank you so, so much for sharing your ideas, your time with us, and for being part of this educational program dedicated to foreign journalists based here in the U.S., Louisville Anderson. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I spoke today with Louvo Anderson, an associate professor of philosophy at Syracuse University, New York, and an affiliate faculty member of Women's and Gender Studies and African American Studies. This educational program uh, was produced by the Association of Foreign Press Correspondents in the United States, and the association is solely responsible for the content of this educational program. So see you all next time. Bye.